Alok, hermane, ya eres mexicana. There you go. <laughs> How cute. Alok is an international, uh, internationally acclaimed writer, performer, and public speaker. As a mixed media artist, the work explores themes of trauma, belonging, um, and the human condition. They are the author of Femme in Public, Beyond the Gender Binary, and Your Wound, My Garden, which I actually uh, loved hearing and reading about. Um, they're the creator of Degender Fashion, which is a topic I could talk um, hours about, even though I know basically nothing about fashion. But then again, <laughs> it's a movement to degender fashion and beauty industries. And uh, it's um, something that I consider deeper than what everyone would like to, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the word here is admit, but how do you tackle this? Like, like, did you see yourself doing this when you were a younger person? And I'm being entirely honest and from the heart here because I did not. And uh, I am here because we are doing comedy together. So I had no idea I was going to end up doing stand up. And uh, I just want to get your take on that. Is this like something that you're looking for? Uh, or is this something that, that you wanted to do like, like um, earlier, like in your life or something? And are you, are you where you wanted to be? Or is this something that diversity just brought to you? You know, I think it's the both hand. On the one hand, I could tell a story about how when I was five or six, I started to put on shows in my living room. <laughs> or all of the local Indian community where I'd wear my mom and my sister's clothes and I'd dance around to the latest Bollywood songs. And I loved being a performer and I loved having people applaud. I loved um, show business. I had this big idea of like, I want to grow up and I want to be a star. Um, there's that story. And then I think the other story is also, I knew that the stage was the only place that people were comfortable with people like me because of the history of drag, I figured on stage I could be myself, wear what I wanted to wear, be expressive with my body and my language, and be safe. So I wonder if I would have been compelled by performance if we lived in a world where trans people could exist in all industries and realms safely. So I don't know how much of it was my own motivations or how much of it was a series of calculations of where can I exist uh, safely? Are there any videos of that? I'm just curious. Not, not that I, uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, like, like sometimes, uh, here's the thing. So when we uh, come out of the closet, usually we tell our parents and it's like this big shock moment for everyone, except our parents that they kind of always knew. And I always like to say that it has to do with the fact that we were dancing when we were kids. <laughs> do, do those videos exist? Have you seen them? I think that they do. And I need to go and digitize them because I'm sure that they're like an old school VHSs, but yes. Um, so let me ask you about your world tour. I've always figured I wanted to go and travel Latin America, and I never thought that someone from the States would figure um, that they might just kind of go ahead and do that. So I just want to ask you, like, why are you here? Oh, look. <laughs> yeah, you know, I grew up in a small town in Texas where I had a bad case of FOMO, fear of missing out, because it felt like all the cool queer stuff was happening in Los Angeles or in New York City. And I kept on thinking, there's no way that I can um, be here and be queer. And so from a very young age, I had this idea of art belongs everywhere. Um, I think we often expect queer people to have to like go to the big city or go to North America in order to experience this. And I've always had very close to my head, and, and maybe you feel the same way, where the internet really taught me that there were people like me all over the world, not just in the places where people think people like me exist. Right. So it's always been important for me when I'm saying world tour, I'm not just meaning US and Europe. <laughs> a lot of my <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, that is, uh, tends to happen. Um, yeah. She, so I, I was in India in January, touring all across India. Um, I was in South Africa and Namibia in December. And a lot of times people will be like, why are you doing a show in Namibia? And I want us to start now saying, why not? Because the truth is that there are queer people everywhere. There are people who are challenging gender norms everywhere. Right. And we have to challenge this idea that the work only belongs in places that we think of as safe or progressive. It belongs everywhere. And then I think also I felt really called to Latin America because as an Indian person, a lot of what I think about is how our current understandings of gender and sexuality are informed by colonialism. So I wanted to come down here and also learn on how people are navigating that, how so often People in our own community will say, this is um, a foreign contagion. Like, 
you're doing. You're, you're violating our culture and tradition. And we're kind of rolling our eyes. Like what history are you talking about here? I tend to see that as well. Here's a funny thing. Um, not to say that we, uh, are not extremely multicultural. I mean, that's what being queer is about. Right. But it turns out that you do see a lot of similarities. Uh, do you see this as you travel? I think one of the things I find in common is the sense of community that all across the world, when I meet queer and trans folks, people are so welcoming and warm to each other. Um, and I experience that people get so confused because I, I think that when people ask me about what's your favorite thing that you did in insert country, I'm not saying the tourist attraction, I'm saying a conversation I had with a queer person. And I think it's so neat that in every place there's a queer community that is thinking big things, having big dreams, and so open to being in conversation. Have you found other um, like non-binary ways of looking at culture? Have you met Musha people? I have, yes. You have? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really annoying when people say things like non-binary is new. Okay, not okay. by annoying. I think annoying synonym colonial. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. yeah I it. <laughs> so much history of, of third gender and otherwise people who have existed forever. And that always reminds me that we're an unbroken chain. Um, I think it, I think it's really, I, I'm doing this a lot being in the U S right now, how they're attempting to disappear us. And part of that disappearance looks like erasing us from our history. And it feels important for me to always say that like, we're an unbroken chain. It's not as if like we were completely erased and now we're re-emerging. We've been here. It's just that we're suppressed. Actually, that's the reason why I do comedy as well. I, I feel that uh, through comedy, I can get to people in ways that maybe they were not expecting it kind of sort of thing. I like to go to places where they don't expect diversity and talk about diversity. Mm -hmm. um, what brought you to comedy? How did you end up like other than like, like what was your like your first open mic kind of sort of situation? Yeah, for sure. So it turns out I had been doing comedy for a very long time. I just wasn't calling it comedy because <laughs> the truth is like you were saying, I didn't see people like us in mainstream comedy. I just saw us as being the butt of the joke um, and never actually the comic. And so I never really identified with the comedy world because it just felt so sexist and so transphobic. So what I was doing is I was on stage and I realized that if I just did my poems, people were depressed. So it started <laughs> thing. I would start riffing and kind of improvising comedy before right. and after my poems. And then I started having more fun doing that. And so then my show became more and more and more comedic and less and less and less poetic. Right. And then eventually my agent was like, you realize you're doing comedy, right? And I was like, oh, oops. Okay. I guess. <laughs> right. So so now I've been doing some kind of sort of thing, right? Yeah. But I think that what's really cool about being queer is that we've had comedic art forms that have not been recognized by the mainstream comedy world forever. Like if you meet with any group of trans people, we're extremely funny because we have gone through so much trauma and comedy is how we endure the trauma and keep going. And so I think that like a lot of my inspiration comes from drag, comes from camp, comes from queer traditions that often don't, don't go, get uh, thought of as stand up. Yeah, being queer is being on stage all the time, right? Yeah. So I do. I I like to read poetry. I am um, unfortunately not. That this is one of the places where the you know the, like the LGBT kryptonite hits me, and I cannot <laughs> write poetry. But I like to read and perform. I am also just starting. I started to play music. I I'm I'm not sure. Do you do you you do play music, right? Or or you have a music I show? Playing, Someone's I grew up playing cello, and I like the cello. I'm sorry. I, yeah, and I <laughs> like. I have like vocal software with me on stage sometimes where I like modify my voice, but I'm really bad at singing. But <laughs> okay. People are like, what can't you do? I'm like, I cannot sing at all. I learned recently that within music theory, they actually have like strong notes and weak notes. I didn't know that. They are gendered. Wow. <laughs> they actually call them male and female notes. No. <laughs> it's like female and female plugs and electronics, like stuff. Right. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, and you see that a lot. So, so it's kind of crazy where we end up just, just wanted to, to see if you have found like other, these like pointlessly gendered situations, uh, cause you might know a lot of them. Like language when we have <laughs> feminine at the end of a word and like a, a chair is considered masculine and something is considered feminine. That stuff is absurd. Is that the uh, easiest thing ever? Emotions, um, professions. Like it's, it's so subtle and so explicit at the same time. I will, I've always wondered who, who comes up with this, right? Like, like who thinks, okay, so this is a chair. Right. 
It's a she. It's weird because cis people will be okay gendering inanimate objects co correctly and insisting on that, but then when it comes to trans people, they're like, hold on. I, I like to say that um, if you want to uh, have a transphobe uh, care about pronouns, you just have to misgender their pets. Absolutely. Right? For sure. And misgendering their kids, too. They get really upset. So um, we have people on the chat. Dan is asking, "What is it? Is it really different? Uh, is the culture, is the queer culture really different uh, from what we have here uh, than what happens in the States? I like, it's really complicated to say that. I, I, I hate comparing countries, but you get my yeah, point. I, I find it really hard because within the U.S. there's so many different queer worlds. Um, I feel like as a queer person of color in the U.S., my experience is very different than a lot of white queer people. Right. And so I, I feel like in the one way, people often say, oh, the U.S. is such a safe space. And it is for some people, but for a lot of people, it's just absolutely not. And then some people will say, well, you know, Latin America is not a safe space. And actually, if, if you're wealthy and if you're <laughs> light skinned, then maybe that's not the case. So I feel like race and class and citizenship really shift our, our experiences of safety. What I will say um, is that in the US, we're, we're very hyper individualized. So access to community is harder to find. And mm. people are really self motivated and self interested. And so often it can feel kind of transactional, like you meet for two hours, and then you don't see each other for months. Whereas I, I find that often when I'm outside of the US and in places in the global south, there's more of a commitment to being together, spending kind of unstructured time together, um, more of a sense of being part of something greater than yourself. I really, really, really don't know where the, or what the future of like queer stand up is. I really hate the no labels term. I hope we, you, don't, you see where I'm coming from with this because I understand if you want us not if you want to delabel your position towards the world, right? I understand that totally. It's just, I hate it when uh, cis heteronormative people say it because basically what they're saying is don't tell me you're queer, right? right. I've always thought that, and just going to be very cynical for 10 seconds, just don't hate me. Uh, but sometimes I think, oh my God, I think I have a job because there are cis heteronormative people out there, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like if, if they stop making a fuss about it, which mm -hmm. do you feel this way as well? Like, like, like are we always answering and you know responding to something that it, i mean it shouldn't be there i agree I, i'm not telling anyone to stop complaining we, we have to complain right we have to uh speak out loud we have to say our stuff but like like what's our future Do, have you ever thought about this i think about this all the time like every time there's some new anti-trans stuff in the media i'm like okay 10 new jokes right you have this perverse relationship to being marginalized because you're like okay new material and that's sad because I don't want us to define ourselves in proximity to discrimination. I want us to be able to like exist fully fleshed out lives. But then at the same time, I also get irritated when people say that our work is so motivated by identity. When you go to these cishet comic shows, they're also motivated by identity. It's just not seen as identity because it's normalized. So when we're saying trans, people are saying, oh, you're being politically, you're being political in your comedy. <laughs> Why isn't it political in your comedy that you're assuming that everyone's straight? That's right. a stance, right? So I, I feel like it's the both and that's always my answer of, I wonder what I would create in a world without transphobia, but I know that I will be creating. Um, and I know that my, my creative spark doesn't just come from being marginalized. It comes from a deeper place. Absolutely. So, so there's a term we use here in um, maybe, maybe it does exist in the States. It's just, I haven't been there to live with it. Uh, it's just break the pact. This is what feminists tell uh, misogynist uh, people when they're not exactly misogynist, misogynist themselves, but their friends are. So they they just don't. So if you have like a misogynist family, you have to break the pact, right? You have to make sure that they stop doing that. And and it, it's just like a message to allies. And it's usually my position towards diversity. I got. I'm honestly a little bit tired of uh, having to answer for transphobes. You know, so you sit down to an interview. The first question is, why do you think people hate you? I'm like, I have no idea. Like, <laughs> like because they're stupid, right? <laughs> like, like, I'm done with them. Um, but then again, there is not all that talk about uh, how do we get these people or what does it take for them to, like, break the pact? 
Um, and I'm not sure. Do you pick this up in your comedy? Like, like I, I've I've heard your comedy do great things, and 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 uh, there's a lot to say about what you joke about. <laughs> no, I I really find it very strange, and maybe this is to your point about how you were saying doors open for you as a YouTuber, right? Where people will say, "I love you," and then go celebrate a gender reveal. Oh, right. Will say, <laughs> "God, you're amazing," and then use he him pronouns for me. And so it's like, you're not actually listening to what I'm saying. And I think what I'm noticing right now is that it's easier for cis people to put us on a stage or a platform and look up to us than it is to actually listen to us. And what it means to listen to us is we're saying, this is not just about accept me as a trans person. This is about saying, redefine your understanding of gender, which means that you have to think more critically about yourself. And so in that way, I see trans comedy as holding a mirror to the world. I'm not just sharing my experience. I'm also showing you that what you thought was absolute permanent reality isn't. That gender is more fluid and complicated than you thought it was. And so I think part of the pact that I want to be broken is people's deep investment in gender norms. Um, right. And oftentimes that gets seen as too much or you're rocking the boat too much. But I know that there will never actually be peace and freedom for me and my, my community unless we do that. Um, the way I go about uh, de-genderizing um, the way I communicate is, I like to say that maybe it's not the norm itself. I know some of these norms, they do have to be questioned and they, they have to be throw, get, thrown against the wall and maybe get rid of them at all, right? But um, I just, I hate the fact that they're, um, they're obligatory, they're mandatory, right? Mm -hmm. And especially they're, they're, they're like, they're, thrown upon people because of something in their bodies, right? Like you have these generals and, it, right. it, and it's because of that, you have to wear dresses. And it's like, right. no, I don't. Sometimes I see people actually hurt themselves trying to get into gender norms and, and just not, not seeing it at all, right? It's kind of crazy how then we are the ones that have to talk into it. Um, transphobes go through gender affirming surgeries a lot. <laughs> Right. People do everything to their bodies all the time. And yet here we are answering for that. Um, Emilio Guardado on the chat is saying that uh, all comedy, all right wing comedy is identitary. Mm -hmm. And I see that. Have you have you met other other comedians, by the way, on your tour, like like people like from Latin America? Just just kind of curious who who have you met? Like, like, like what's, what, what kind of people are you seeing? Well, we're just basically starting the tour this week. I just had a show in Bogota on Friday, so I'm meeting people. Um, and my world tour, yes, I've met comics all over the world, but I'm excited to meet comics here in Latin America to see what y'all find funny. Because what I realized in Bogota was we had a live interpreter and people kept on telling me that he kept on laughing while translating, which I thought was the cutest thing. Because imagine, oh. imagine that job description, like we need you to remain stone-faced as you're translating bussy into Spanish. Like it's, <laughs> it's a tall order, right? Right. <laughs> Hilarious. But I wish that I could have had just footage of that person for the show to see what was funny and what wasn't, because humor is so culturally specific. The things that I joke from are very from a U.S. perspective, so I don't anticipate everyone will laugh at all of my jokes because of the cultural context. And I'm excited to see what is more universal and what's more particular. Mexico has a very particular way of communicating. I think this is all, this is very, probably very global, but I find it here in Mexico, uh, being that it was... Uh, a colonized country um there's a gazillion ways to communicate without communicating mm. so there's this thing they call uh tent comedy carpa um and it, like a circus tent right and usually rather than saying the president is an idiot which is something that you would normally say in the states <laughs> a lot of the time uh, you would actually make a character out of the president and then he acts as an idiot. So mm -hmm. the so you send the onus of you know the, to the watcher. They, now they have to say, "Oh, the president's an idiot." Does it make sense? Right. And and it's like this these subtle things that you learn when you come to Mexico. Because I'm Colombian, and uh, you see that people have learned to communicate like in like ninja ways around <laughs> the usually things. But this is because of That's all the oppression. Yeah. Um, there's a word that you must learn. Uh, uh, it's actually it's it's a term, and there's you could you could study this for years. You might get it eventually. I haven't. Um, it's called albur. Albur is double speak. So usually albur is a little bit misogynistic because when you say double speak, everyone will just say like you know genital jokes. But 
Um, it's a really genius way of communicating and it comes from the same place. So I am making, I am insulting you or I'm telling you things, but you don't know I'm telling you these things. Everyone else does. And it's kind of crazy that these dynamics exist. I love them because I think it's, uh, it's part of the resistance. But uh, nonetheless, it's the way people communicate here. And I'm not sure you, we have, I mean, you guys have a lot of that in the States, but then again, the States is so diverse. <laughs> you could probably find a lot of Mexicans talking uh, in Albur in the States like right. that, right? Um, were you exposed to some of this growing up, like, like in Texas? Because, you know, Texas is uh, very Mexican. Yes, I was. In fact, I was, most of my peers thought I was Mexican growing up. <laughs> of course. They could not understand that India existed. If you were brown, then you were Mexican. So I feel like I've experienced the buffet of all different kinds of racism. So I've always felt the affinity. <laughs> right. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. I mean, similarly, I, I feel like growing up in an Indian in immigrant community, the way that we joked was very different. Mm -hmm. um, because I think people were experiencing so many microaggressions, so much like racism and xenophobia, but they didn't want to puncture the narrative that their immigration was based off of, which is we're going to have more opportunities here. It's amazing. And so they never wanted to say this fucking sucks because that would invalidate that narrative. So right. instead they would often just mock their peers or mock other people. But behind that mockery was I think a deeper grief that couldn't be named because it would implicate something larger and more painful. And so what I'm always really interested in is paying attention to how everyday people use humor as a way to survive. Because I think for a long time, I understood comedy as just flippant. But now I understand flippancy and superficiality is actually really essential strategies for it to live a good life. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there is a term we use here for uh, like the uh, gay or queer coded uh, way of speaking called jotear. Um, comes from the letter J. It used to happen that... Uh, See, Mexico has a long story with diversity. I mean, everyone does, right? But Mexico had a, uh, a Stonewall moment in 1903, I think it was. Um, it's called uh, Baile de los Cuarentino, Dance of the 41. Uh, 41 people were extracted from home and there were like po uh, politicians, kids there, queer people. There's a movie about it uh, in case you want to see it. Um, and it just brings to mind that, well, you know, this is like a full 60 years before Stonewall. <laughs> and wow. uh, uh, it's usually not spoken because there's... I, I'm not complaining. I love it. This is my flag. <laughs> this is a uh, uh, like a this is a huge flag. I sleep under it sometimes. Um, but we celebrate the American way of the LGBT movement, when, and that's perfectly fine. I mean, I'm not complaining at all. Yet we have all these like long stories, and and usually um, they're all centered on the way that we tell people that uh, we are so diverse, and it's kind of crazy to think that we're still doing this a hundred years later. Right. I really, I really love the way it's come about. Like I've met the nicest and the craziest and, you know, like the most important people in my life are all the LGBT people. Um, I met you. Um, so there's that, <laughs> but, uh, I just, sometimes I, uh, I'm just not sure about the future. Danny Soriano is saying just because I'm like an anxious person, right? This is why I'm talking about this. Uh, Danny Soriano on the chat is saying, having grateful, um, a locus here, Certain to speak out about breaking barriers and building bridges and doing it through comedy is the most intelligent way. I think it's intelligent to talk about this through comedy. I wish that I could hear Freud just watching your improv because it, it improv makes you be in your most subconscious state because you're just saying immediately what comes to mind without filter. And I think that that is so important to see what, what to take inventory of that part of ourselves. Uh, so we don't have a lot of time. I, I asked for uh, 30 minutes and this is us. So... Can we just like talk really quick about your tour, where you're going, what we're doing, and when people can see us? Because we're here because we're doing comedy together. So tomorrow, which is July 19th, I've got a show in Guadalajara that there's still tickets for. And then on July 20th, I'll be joining you for two shows in Mexico City. I think there's like three tickets left. So if you're watching <laughs> and you don't have one, get it. Because otherwise, it's going to be totally sold out, which, which congratulations to us. So exciting. Yeah. Then I'll be in Santiago on Saturday and Chile. In Chile, okay. Yeah. That's, not, that's not close from here. <laughs> no. And that's so sold out, so see you there. And then on Monday, I'll be in Sao Paulo and Brazil. There's still tickets left for that. Then I'll be ending Latin American portion of the tour in Buenos Aires next Wednesday, and there's still tickets for that. Can I ask you a logistics question about this? Are you presenting 
you're you're doing everything in English, right? Yeah. No translator. Different venues have translation or not. The ones in Mexico don't. And then, you know, do you do you, you talk to people afterwards? Is is this like I, I sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I'm just curious. Yeah. I love going to my merchandise table afterwards and having those conversations with people. Um, I feel like it it really shifts my sense of the show because I've been doing this show so many times. It's really helpful to remember, okay, it actually lands on people. It's not just like words that I'm reciting on stage. I'm excited. I'm, I'm really happy. And I just wanted to also publicly thank you for letting me be on your stage. Um, I've done lots of things on stage and this is probably one of the craziest things that I see myself doing, uh, especially because I'm as an aspiring musician, because I really, I mean, you, you can't sing. Uh, I can't sing either, but I try. Uh, so uh, it's always mission mash, and I'm just gonna actually um, test myself. So, so I figured I'm gonna do a couple of things that I've never done, and, and uh, oh, wow, I'm so excited! Let's let's see where that takes us. But other than that, um, yeah, we'll be there. I'll be at six thirty, and you're doing a double bill. Uh, no, you're doing a six thirty and nine, and yeah. uh, you were almost double sold out. So that's great. I love to hear that because Mexico is a great place. There's a word. Um, uh, I, uh, Alok, hermane, ya eres mexicane. There you go. <laughs> oh, cute. So, uh, just one last question uh, uh, from Gustavo Mir saying, any suggestions to anyone that wishes to start off being a full-time public activist? Hmm. Um, if you, you have any words for that, I, I, all I can say is uh, just go easy and make sure you have people around you. Yeah, that yeah. part. Um, right? Think about safety and don't feel like you have to expose yourself in da dangerous situations when you're not ready. And pace is a very beautiful thing. Um, so really recognize that you have, you can't go from a scarcity mentality, you have to go from abundant mentality, which means that you have time to grow into yourself and to grow into your advocacy. Right. Your, if one wanted to buy one of those remaining three tickets, uh, yep. where, where would you go? <laughs> link in my instagram bio my handle is at a l o k v m e n o n and then click the mexico city date or click the Gu guadalajara date if you're there and you can get the tickets there you go all right well thanks everyone for coming here thank you for doing this thank you so much, and uh, i'll see you on thursday yeah um, see you soon. i promise from the bottom of my heart that i will not burn the venue down um, <laughs> so that you can perform after me all right <laughs> <laughs> and bye bye